this is the original previs we did. So I, I did this like in the first couple of weeks of the movie, and the reason why you have to do this is to figure out even how to do the shot, and thematically does the shot work. And what we're trying to establish is that this particular shot um, lets you see the entire world you're gonna see, introduce you to sort of the storybook nature of Hugo's world, and then get kind of more and more realistic as you go along and finally end up on the start of the movie. So what you're actually seeing is all the characters that you're gonna see, where they live, what they do, and stuff like that. If you, you know, there's a, the cafe, and then there's the, the toy store on the left, and the crowds, and all that stuff. So we wanted to be one shot that actually uh, created all that. And then once you do it, you have to figure out, now that I've made this mess, how am I gonna shoot it? And that, that becomes the second part of the previous uh, solution. So the next thing we'll see is, um, how we actually accomplish it. And these are actually real buildings in Paris that were taken and they were uh, texture mapped and all the stuff and these were actually the, the style of the real trains. Everything was art directed to be very specific. And then the people, the only way to actually shoot the people and make them realistic is to put them on, on uh, uh, treadmills. So they're on green treadmills. And uh, it seems cheesy, but it worked. And this, uh, the only way I could get it fast enough is to get a camera car, and what we noticed is that uh, the people who want to get them close enough, they, they have to run and duck out of the way of the oncoming truck, so they're all stunt people. And the only way to get in on him that close was a bush patrol shot. So we used basically everything that we wanted to do throughout the And here's the next piece, which is kind of the, the inspiration for the film shot. To create one shot and do the sense of what it's like to be in the world that only he really inhabits behind the scenes.
this set ends over here and becomes the last set. We shot this like three days before we wrapped the movie. Do you want to go through the whole thing or stop again? This, this is it, yeah. Well, there's the crash, the train crash and all that stuff. You want to save that for later? Yeah, you want to pause it for a second, Dan? Um, I'm having yeah, the same reaction to this that Harrison Ford did to David Blaine. <laughs> the video that's been going around, he swore. Yeah. Um, I actually, I was convinced that the wheel that he runs through was digital. And then I'm watching with all these different pieces and so much of it's an elaborate set. And I actually think it's a terrific, you know, I'm glad that so much of it was physical. Uh, and it's about, you know, like how are we going to get a camera into this physical place versus let's just make the whole thing up. And he's on, like, you know, a green, you know, what we well, want. We wanted, to, um, yeah, we wanted to do that as much as real as possible because then your eye kind of detects some of that stuff. And when it becomes too fantastic that you really can't do it, the only way you can do is CG kind of cheapens the shot or it feels like it does. And, you know, the, the easiest thing to do is do a CG kid and then you can do whatever you want. But that wasn't fun enough. And, you know, part of the thing where we're doing the, the shot that was take four of him running through, and one of the ideas was, you know, which is uh, uh, what a kid does, is that if you're in your house or whatever and you're a kid, you jump up and you tap the ceiling and you do whatever. And so that sort of came up, that little thing, and pausing at just the right moment when the wheel came along was natural. That's what he did. And so it kind of adds to him owning that environment. And those little happy accidents and those things that the actor brings and you bring when you watch it and do take after take. And uh, he hit the most natural vibe around take four. He's a great kid, by the way. Uh, um, and so, you know, you want his contribution to it. He's the kid who has to embody it. You have to believe it's him. You're going to believe it for the rest of the movie. So you want enough to do as much as much CG. You want it because CG is a little takes the personality out of it. You really want the personality put into it. And uh, so that was the easiest way of doing it. It wasn't when we were doing uh, Avatar, we were doing something else. So. I like that you described it as the easy way. It was the easy way. Well, it's easy for me. Yeah. Well, sorry. And you said there was something about the uh, oh, cold shoes. Yes, the cold shoes. That, you know, once I came up with the gag, and, and you know, I'll take all the credit for it, we, we wanted to do something more. You wanted to do something uh, specific that would be kid-like. And so we came up with a coal shoot, and um, then you, the, when we shot in 3D, there was a, it's a huge camera because it's actually two cameras with a piece of glass in the middle. It's called a beam splitter, it's a big piece of glass that allows the camera shooting down to be at the same level as the camera shooting this way. So it's huge and it can't really move anywhere. But I still wanted to do the shot, and I sort of now, you know, again, put myself out on the limb and said, We can do it, but now I have to figure out how to do it. So we were talking about it, and I said, Well, what if we build a thing that revolved? And the camera, all has to do is just basically ride down this sort of corkscrew, and then it just has to move opposite of the kid sliding, and you just have to do it kind of precisely. That's we can do that, can't we? And um, they said no, we can't. You know, that's great. We can't do that. And it's like, well, you know, I got a C plus in science. I think it could work. <laughs> um, so you know, that's where the ballsy part of the program comes. Well, yeah, I can do that. Well, let's test it once. So I had it while I was shooting other things, testing it. And what I discovered is the, the guy who built it wanted to do all mechanical and have a you know, motor and all that stuff. I said, I think we need like four guys that push it based on how the kid's sliding out of the thing. And if we wax the thing, it's going to go faster. It's going to go faster. If he, if he catches on and he goes slower and so on. Uh, uh, ultimately, we ripped out all the mechanics and had these four guys, most of them named Malcolm and Lionel, it's all done in England. Um, they, they would watch the monitor and see how he's going and, and, and go accordingly, and then the camera would go uh, tilt down accordingly to that. So it became kind of live, you know, it became a real thing. And we did that time, we did 18 takes, and I got the take that, that worked and didn't embarrass me as much as the other ones. And, and ultimately that's how we did it. But it was a, a, a general thing when I do any kind of this stuff is when everybody in the room says it can't be done, then it's worth doing. Then, then we'll do that. Because then, then, it's, then it's fine. Well, the snow. I mean, I see the snow all the time. When we go to the screens, the snow is, uh, I like the snow. But that's even as crappy as snow. That's like, you just threw it in there to illustrate uh, that what it could be like. Is it? Well, that's what I like. That's what you showed me. That's what I like. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we have an hour left. And it took a year to do that. So you know that, right? It's not what you showed me. It's not what you showed me. I'm like, uh, okay. And then, so again, you know, figured out. We had a, a map, which is a black and white image of the, of the snow that we were going to use to just balance the snow against the background. 
And so since I had that, I had it in 3D, since I had the right eye, we made big, chunky, funky looking snow to look like what we did very hastily just to prove the point. And I had to do it three times. First time came back, it was 15 minutes later, we did it. The next time we go, nah, not good enough. Sorry. All right, well now we have 30 minutes to go before we go. And we did it three more times, and we did it all in DI, so it was done on a baseline. That's not really necessarily made to do compositing. We did it all, and then we hit the fourth one, and he went, yeah, that's it. Good. All right. He's, he's a mighty calm guy. It's just, you know, it's such a strange thing, and for editors also, we might such a long way from a grease pencil that goes through the, and you're like, imagine it is all there. You know, or seam missing filler. Or just, you know, it's like the, the level of imagination there in that universe and the level of imagination here. You're saying, like, give me an hour, I can do three massive versions of this, you know, this trick and do these backflips. It's like, you know, having, having the technology on your side, it must be a big, you know, a big asset. But once you have a ton of tools, then you can figure out you know, uh, other ways of doing things. You know, if I have a mat and I have, I know the baseline can do that, and I know that our DI colorist is very adventuresome and he knows how to use this gear pretty well. It's something that, even though it seems like it's an odd thing or that it shouldn't happen, it's like, well, you know, you have enough tools at your disposal and you get fluent with them enough and you have no fear, you can do it. You know, you, you, you can do it. It's, it, it it's, uh, and why not? You know, why go through this big elaborate thing, sending it back to Germany and doing all this stuff? Uh, the reason I say for Germany is that uh, it's actually done in England is that um, because we're waiting so desperately to see this particular shot since it's the opening of the movie, um, three days before, uh, and it's not a so three days before the two compositors that composite this you know, crazy shot quit and got up and left the building to not be found and heard of again for weeks. They just said, wow, it's like, well, that's not a I'll tell you that right now. And, um, and Marty asked me three days before, so how's it going? Well, good. <laughs> and I told him about the two guys who quit, and he laughed and laughed. It didn't bother him. And so we had, uh, uh, the, the company had uh, nine compositors in Germany who actually flew into London, invaded London, and, uh, and took over the thing. And in three days, we got that shot from, from nothing. Actually, so it was a you know it's the willpower. The people love doing it. The people that in, worked in the visual effects in this movie adored this movie because it was about the father of visual effects and it meant something to them in some sort of special way. And they were motivated up for 56 hours doing this work and nonstop. And that's why I didn't have the heart to tell them they didn't like the snow. <laughs> uh, well, it's an interesting segue because you're talking about a movie that, that does a lot with a lot. You know, it's a huge movie in every possible way. And Mark, we were talking about a film uh, that uh, you did a lot with a little, and uh, watching it, you did a lot. I mean, it wasn't, I was expecting it to be sort of these subtle things that you don't notice, but it's an amazing amount of work that was done. Um, I'm going to mispronounce the title if you don't jump in and tell me what it's called. Synecdoche, New York. Perfect. Yes. <laughs> All right. Um, which is a smaller film, it's a Charlie Kaufman film. Has anyone seen the film? Hey, wow, I think the nice. entire population that saw the movie is right here. <laughs> Everyone that saw it is in this room right now. Um, but um, you can just tell that there's a world, right? He creates these places that are so complete. Um, what was it like working on that? And, and I guess, you know, you could also start with the clip. But tell me about the experience first. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you a little about it first. I mean, working with Charlie Kaufman, I, I think a large part of, and forgive me for speaking for Rob here, but a large part of, of our job is to try and understand what it is that the director is after when they're making a film and try and fit into that workflow and understand it and be an extension of it a lot of the time. And I think working with someone like Charlie Kaufman is a very interesting experience. He is, he is one of the smartest people I've ever met and one of the most tortured people I've ever met. So everything that he does and everything that he is showing you and everything that he's written has so many different layers of pain involved in it that I think when you, when you watch Synecdoche, and I've seen it maybe a dozen times, I'm always discovering things about the movie that I don't remember while being involved in it. Like, I watch and I go, they couldn't have changed that. Well, how come I never saw this before? And I think that's, that's a testament to me of, of Charlie's brilliance, and that he's built so many layers into his story that 
that I didn't understand at the time, but yet I still tried to achieve and try to help him execute, that all come through on screen after you've seen it again and again and again and again. And I think that, that was a large part of this movie for him was how you tell a story about aging and death and the passage of time in two hours, essentially, in a world that's inside a world, inside another world, inside another world. It's like an onion. You peel it and you keep finding new layers inside it. And I, I think once I understood that, which probably took about two and a half months during prep and the beginning of the shoot, all of a sudden it kind of made sense for him that, that everything just wanted to have this depth and texture. So we, for me it was, it was an interesting challenge because there was very, very, very small effects budget for what we had to do. And part of the process was to work with Mark Friedberg, who was a production designer, and figure out where his physical building would stop and where the visual effects would continue. And for those of you who, who live and work in New York, shooting in New York is a very challenging process because the, there are no giant sound stages here. Um, physical locations, while beautiful, are incredibly restrictive. So you're only in a place for a certain amount of time. Um, we ended up building a large part of the set in an armory, which was you know, it's not an ideal place to shoot. It's a big cavernous, cold area, and you're shooting probably in the middle of the winter. So we built a set, and it, it, was a, it was a conversation constantly back and forth with us, going, well, you know, if I built this part here, can you take it from here? And, and, and the interesting part about that movie is it, it's about <clears throat> Philip Seymour Hoffman's character building a world. So we had the luxury of being able to build things that were supposed to be half-constructed. So the illusion became, where does the, the artificial construction stop, and where does the CG part take it from there? And we sort of played with that a lot. Like we would shoot, we would shoot the buildings of an, of an initial set. It was all scaffolding and kind of like an erector set. And then he would put a couple walls up. And then suddenly we would shoot a real location, and I would take walls away to make it look like the same place. And, and part of the story was that they were also building replicas of the real world. So we would go shoot a real location. And we would construct a set version of that real location. So we had a lot of like textural elements that we could play with and bring back and forth from one to another. And for me, the challenge was keeping it as simple as possible. So it was a lot of two-dimensional compositing where possible. We built we built a 3D environment to, to put the thing in. And for those of you who know visual effects at all, generally when you when you step from 2D into 3D, the price goes up exponentially because you have to deal with camera tracking, you have to deal with modeling, lighting, and shading, and texturing, and all the things that, that need you to bring in additional people to get things to look real. So for me, a lot of it was to try and do it as photographically as possible. We did build the CG environment that we rendered from a couple different angles, because as those of you who have seen the movie, the idea is that at some point, the entire city of New York is inside of a warehouse, which is actually inside of another warehouse, inside of another warehouse. So we, we had to build this, essentially, warehouse that we could place in the backgrounds of different shots to make it feel at the end of the movie that Wherever you are, you were still inside a building, um, and it was it was great. Once we had that built, we, we started during prep, and I, I remember there was a moment. And it was probably two weeks in when we first started scouting locations. We were looking at places in Delmo to shoot, and I, I took a still photo during the location scout, and I came back to the office and I started playing around in Photoshop, and I just took one of the armories that we had shot, and I put the roof of the armory over the Brooklyn Bridge. And it was, you know, it's that typical Dumbo view where you're on the cobblestone streets and you see the Manhattan Bridge on one side and the Brooklyn Bridge on the other. And to see that with a dome over it, and you know, something about the, the way the little composite I did worked, you had the light coming in from the same direction, so it kind of felt a little natural. Um, it became sort of the, the selling piece for the design of the movie, and we sort of showed that around saying, this is kind of what we're after, and it was this weird image where you're seeing something you've seen a thousand times before, but in a totally different way. And for me, it, it sort of, it, it made the whole movie gel and kind of inspired the rest of the work. And, and working with someone like Charlie Kaufman, I think, like working with Martin Scorsese, you have people are so engaged and so eager to contribute. It made the job a lot easier. Like it, it was great to be able to get people to give 110%, whereas it was still an art film, and you're not paying them full rates. And, and you know, I was negotiating a lot of lucky deals with people who maybe didn't have the experience to do Hugo, um, but they were all so eager and excited to put, you know, a thousand percent into the project because they knew it was something really interesting and, and not a typical effects one. Um, I don't remember where your question was, but I hope that answered. That wasn't about at all. Where'd you get that sweater? Okay, so they cut me smaller. I can shop that sort. Um, actually, let's. Uh, why don't we look at the clip and then you know these. You can,
show them what you're talking about. It's, it's really amazing. Mm -hmm. I think we did zero previews on this movie. Thank you. 
computer and what I learned about it uh, uh, to actually previs the crash. And then because I'm a cameraman and I make my decisions in a very analog way. If you ever look through a camera and the cameraman, you aim it and you go, ah, it's, it's crappy, let me go over here, this light looks a little more interesting. And you make about 50 different decisions in a very analog, quick way, and then you, you kind of hone in on what you're going to do. Well, that's not what I'm used to. I'm not used to a computer like that, so I made them do both. I created a, a previous scenario that I could hand operate, and then I like to edit, so I can hand operate, create a plane crash, then film it from multiple different angles and create a sequence in editorial that I can actually accomplish on the day. And so I learned and basically uh, learned how to shoot a plane crash. I shot it like 15 times. No one else saw it but me. And I would walk over from doing this previous to editing it and say, eh, maybe it's another close-up. Go and shoot another close-up. And all of a sudden, it started to have a rhythm of something that worked that I knew that I could pull off. So I shot one before. I had experience doing it. And I thought, that was cool. And that's how I shot the plane crash. And that's a really cool way of working. And who do I know who likes to, to work that way um, and is interested in cinematography, editing, he's an editor, and is a director. And it's such a great tool to be able to experiment offline. And um, uh, if you want to expand it from what I do, which is very simple, which is one guy on a computer and me with hand operated wheels, like the same thing as the Lou McCrane or whatever, uh, to the motion capture stage. Um, and so I found one guy who likes to edit, likes to shoot, um, and it's a multimillionaire, and he could pay for it. So I uh, looked at camera, and I said, you know, you might really like to do this. And he was not um, um, doing the film at the time. He was planning a thing called Battle Angel. And um, so he got intrigued because he's, he's a really brilliant guy, and, and uh, he made the new technology was really intriguing. And what it was intriguing about it is being able to direct a computer-generated movie like you direct a live action movie. And anybody who is used to live action is terrified of computer work because you, your personality is removed from the actual decision making of where a camera goes, how it moves, when it moves, when it pans, when it tilts, uh, using a 14 instead of an 18. All the various things that we do for granted is now has to be done in advance and it's just not intuitive. So he funded it and I made up this thing which basically made the concept of how you would do a film like Avatar and then he just determined he was going to do Avatar. Because now I can actually direct the movie like a Jim Cameron movie that was done in a, in, a, um, in a computer, or mostly done in a computer. So what I learned on Aviator, which is I'm going to use it to previs live action I'm going to shoot, he used it to actually do the CG work on it. And so every decision that was made was made by him hand-holding a camera, <laughs> operating the shot, art directing it in real time, and handing over the template over to Weta and now their responsibility is to make what he just did look real, but not reinvent his shot. He wants that shot because he's the director and the editor. He knows, and the cinematographer, he knows exactly why he picked that particular move at that particular time when it cuts to that shot, not interpreted by people who are not sensitive to that. So they did exactly what he wanted to do, and so it became a, a sort of a technique for getting somebody with a live action and talent to direct that film. Well, what do you want to show that? Show the, yeah. the, 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 the previous portion. Is everybody familiar with motion capture, by the way? Good. One second. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's really interested in motion capture. I want you to freeze it for a second, so I'll um, make it make sense. Can you freeze that? Okay, um, so what you're seeing is there's a camera with a little video screen on it, and those balls are attached to it. From anything in a motion capture room, it's basically a whole bunch of cameras surrounding uh, these retro-reflective balls, they're called. So the computer sees it and says, okay, now I know what that thing is, what you want me to control with it. And so in our case, it's controlling a camera. So my camera in real time on a real stage is actually uh, powering or puppeteering a computer-generated camera, photographing a computer-generated world. So what I'm doing is I'm translating it out of the computer into my lap, and I'm walking around with the camera, and I'm finding the shot. So even though there's nothing in front of me, when you start looking through the eyepiece of the camera or you look at a video screen, just like you're looking at a DV camera when you're taking home movies, you start bl blocking out everything, you just look at the screen, and all of a sudden you are perfectly comfortable in that world, much like a camera is comfortable. So the lens is not, there's no lens, there are these reflective balls that are causing well, that image to occur. The lens is chosen by, so this is the early prototype, and then when we made the real thing, 
then there's a button on it that's actually the zoom lens, so you would turn it and it would zoom the CG camera, which in turn shows you on your little screen the zoom that you're doing. So again, you say, well, 14 is better than 18 in this particular case, and well, let's try 21. And how, let me, let me shoot 21, but let me go back and reshoot the whole thing with 100. I mean, there's a, some about shooting with a 100 millimeter lens that's cool. And the other portion of it that makes it very analog is, you're all, if you're editors, you have dailies. Dailies are, you play the scene from master from one angle, and then you do a close-up from another angle, you do an over from another angle, and you keep on doing it. And then you pick and choose the moment that is the most appropriate for what shot. In CG, you generally don't do that. You tell somebody you need a four-second shot here, an eight-second shot here. But in this technique, you just shoot dailies. And then, in editorial, you start picking each particular moment. So let's play a little more, and you kind of get a sense now that I gave you a very obtuse explanation for it. So what I'm seeing is that guy lying on the ground. Now, it's a game version of it, so it's not perfect, and it will get more perfect. That's me pretending to know what I'm doing. That's a quizzical look. What the hell am I doing? <laughs> So now I, I, you know, because I like to look through an eyepiece, so now I, I made a, a device that looked like an eyepiece into the shoulder-mounted camera. And what I'm seeing, or what you're seeing in the, in the screen behind it, is whatever I'm walking and moving around in real time, uh, uh, feeding me back the image that I want. And then I decide when I'm going to tilt up, and when I'm going to pan over to the other person, or whatever I'm going to do. And, uh, and it starts to have a real-life quality to it. And then, <clears throat> once you understand the technology, that stick, that goofy stick, can be anything. It could be a uh, hundred people on horses, it could be clouds, it could be trees, it could be, in this particular case, it's a light. So now I said, okay, make that thing control a lamp, and it's moving a lamp. And so all of a sudden, you can now really art direct the hell out of your set and treat it much like a live action piece. Uh, do you want to? Yeah, let's look at the, uh, which one is it, the previous uh, number, I'm thinking it's number three. Yeah. Well, I mean, this is sort of like, this is a very crude version, so I'll show you. What, I, what Jim paid for initially before it became like the real model that, that was in the $300 million version of the movie. So um, what I did is, and this is very crude, so I look really stupid, but trust me on this. Uh, you'll believe it's really stupid too. Um, it's uh, my daughter's playing the, one of the characters in Avatar, and her friend from acting class is in it. And I was showing Jim what you can do with what the language of this particular thing is, which is very similar to the language of movies. What's a steady cam? What's a crane shot? What's all those various things? <clears throat> and the fact that there's no storyboards, I'm making up the scene as I'm shooting it. So what I did is I took a page out of what he, he, he likes to do is a, a, calls a script in which he writes basically a treatment with some dialogue in it, and that becomes the basis of Avatar. So I took a couple pages out, which is um, uh, 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 the uh, Viper Wolf scene, if you're familiar with the movie. And it wasn't fleshed out yet, so it was very vague. It much more, you know, very simplistic, very vague. And I just made up a scene, and I didn't care that it looked that great or not, because it was really about showing you, showing the filmmaker the tools of how you could make a movie like this. And you could edit it on the day, so as you're shooting it, you're cutting it and determining if you made a mistake or not, or you want to embellish it, or you have a happy accident you want to take advantage of it. So this, you're going to see something really stupid and crude, but this is the very beginning of that. And be nice, it's my daughter. <laughs> And does he know what the number is? Number three, right? Uh, number three, yes. That's not bad. That's a friend. She's better than that. We'll see. See, so this is all pretty much handheld. It's all, you know, stuff they found on the computer. Um, just some outfit that they found. Motion capture, not a lot of time spent to make it look, you know, like the real thing, like the real thing. That gives you the idea.
It's a very sad thing, and it's all your fault. But they attacked me. Yeah, well, if you knew what you were doing, they wouldn't have attacked you. Well, could I have done? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, hold it again. Move up. Uh, that was that was the very beginnings of it, and what it illustrated for Jim was, um, you know, one of the things we had to do was that if you go on stage in a motion capture thing and you want to photograph someone's face, you kind of need to see the face. So, what is the easiest way of doing it? The easiest way of doing it is, we, besides the face rig that now actually captures the facial performance with tremendous detail like it's never been done before, which was done in the movie, you also have a video camera and you're photographing a face, and in real time you get to plaster that face onto the CG character that's walking around, so when you're out directing the shot, you could stop it on a frame, you could back it up, you could move the camera anywhere you want, and then play it, and you could see that the character actually speed. And it's, you know, it's not quite, you know, again, like live action, but it's fairly close. And the possibilities when you're somebody like Jim, where uh, what was mind-blowing to him is, you're on a stage that's not terribly bigger than the stage we have here, so all the action scenes you see, the running and all that stuff, is taking place in a small environment, and it shows you how to use your imagination for it. And what he got blown about was the fact that um, if I'm standing here with this camera, I could put the camera anywhere I want, not necessarily related to the person I'm photographing, because they're not really in front of me, they're only in front of me by the choice that's in the computer, so, if I say I'm standing here and you're 30 feet in the air, I have to tilt up my camera to photograph you. And if you're mining, like what the guy was doing, that you're walking on tree limbs, all of a sudden I got an advantage point in a second of something that would take me a long time on the stage to do. And that part became really bizarre for him, which is that even though you're on a stage and actors are in front of you in real time, you get to direct in real time, they're not really standing next to you. They're standing wherever you say they are in the computer. And all of a sudden, possibilities are endless. And then you get to do anything you want. And it becomes very elaborate. Something like Jim is quite a bright guy. He was able to take advantage of it and create very complicated scenes with multiple actors in them. And he's able to hand direct them each, each portion of the shot. Um, and, uh, and it's like a dream come true for your director. You're directing a CG shot. Is, you want to have control over every moment and get the versatility that you wish to get. And you have, you're the one controlling it. If you're standing in somebody's back there, you can tell them, move over, look to the left, to think your hand motion is a little too much, let's tone it down, let's do this, actually, let, let's switch positions with the other. You, all of a sudden, that's all real-time stuff. That's, that would be 30 iterations in a, a, a quick-time movies that CG artists would give you. And then you kind of lose your way around take 27, and it's like, oh, I can just <laughs> so the real time aspect of it was pretty cool. Would you like to show the final? Sure, if you want to see a, a, maybe a portion of it. So now that's the crude version that says, okay, now you can do this. Now let's turn it into something that you would actually use for feature film. So we'll just show a portion of it. Yeah, this see. is number four, and, and Dan, I know how much you love scrubbing through a VLC file, but do your best. Do your best. So this is now, you know, obviously you can use my interpretation. And my daughter sadly did not get the part. <laughs> she also played the rock. She was good. She was good. She had a certain stillness to it, I think. Quiet. Quiet. Dan's hating us right now. He's like, as long as I don't have to scrub. About halfway through that. Sorry. Sorry. Maybe less. Sorry. 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 That's good. And this is done exactly the same way. So a, a similar camera, not the same. But the same idea. So every shot you see here, uh, if you can see it, is, um, is all done exactly the same way. And then instead of the game version that you were seeing in the camera, this becomes the meta version where now it's, it's you know, fully realized and lit and all this stuff. But it's all done exactly the same way. This is all done on the motion capture stage.
I don't know about goddamn night. Nice.